and consistent with being really efficient in the tech industry, this is what we're going to do. Every panelist is going to introduce himself and answer a question. And the question is, this is a very forward-looking event. Um, it's focused on jobs, American jobs specifically in the future. What do I have to, uh, up here sitting a lot of people who know a lot about immigration? So the question I'll ask you, immigration, good or bad for jobs and the economy? Let's start out with you, Stuart. Introduce uh, yourself. Uh, Stuart Anderson, Executive Director of the National Foundation for American Policy. It's a policy think tank. Uh, previously, I was head of policy at the INS in the Bush administration and worked in, on Capitol Hill. In answer to your question, um, the, the research I've done shows that immigrants are very positive for the economy and for job creation. Uh, last year, I looked at uh, 87 companies that were billion-dollar startups, the unicorns, and found out more than half of them uh, had at least one immigrant founder. Uh, and 70% of them had an immigrant in a key job-creating position, like VP of engineer. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, international students, when they're able to stay here, and they also create jobs. One of the billion-dollar startup companies uh, was App Dynamics, created by Yati uh, Bansal. Uh, he waited seven years to start the company after he had the idea because he couldn't get his green card. So he's waiting, stuck on an H-1B visa. Once he, got the, once he got the green card, he was able to create the company, and it was recently bought by Cisco for almost $4 billion and employs almost 1,000 people. Robbie, what's your story? Because you have a very unique one. Yo, my name is uh, Ravi Cabral. Uh, I'm CEO and founder of Benji Lock. Um, born and raised in Dominican Republic, and I've been living here now for uh, nine years. And um, I say that yes, immigrants, it's a uh, it's a good thing for uh, society because uh, me being an immigrant, uh, I've seen uh, hell on earth. I won't lie to you. From the beginning of coming to this country to the point that I am right now, which I'm still self-funded with my own grind, uh, but I think uh, it's just a good thing. Well, tell us about, uh, just a little bit about your, your company and what, what you've done and, and how you see yourself growing. Well, uh, just a, 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 the idea actually came up because uh, I got laid off from work when I actually thought that I made the American dream, finally landing a job in a full-time uh, company in a real estate there in LA. Uh, I just got laid off in the month of December, and the same day I got laid off, uh, my daughter was born at midnight. So you can imagine the, the grind that, uh, you know, that, that I went through, and I got overweight, I got depressed, and uh, going through that journey, that's how the idea of, the, of Benji Lock came with it, going to the gym on a daily basis, and uh, I said to myself, why nobody has come up with this innovation? So I decided to pursue it, and four years into it, uh, I decided to go to CES for my first time and unveil the innovation there. And uh, I'm still, I'm here, so I'm, I'm actually proud to be here, so. And yeah. we gained a member. <laughs> Jimena. Yeah, how, how do I follow that? Uh, well, I'm Jimena Harsok. I am immigrant here. I was born and raised in Chile. And um, I'm the founder, co-founder of a company called Phone to Action. And what does, what Phone to Action does is we build core technologies to connect people with their lawmakers so they can share their opinions uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, we started with email and we went Facebook, Twitter, phone calls, etc. If you followed the weekend events with Samantha B's non-White House Correspondents Dinner, uh, you may have heard about the drunk dial, your legislator. Uh, some of them did drunk dial, and uh, that was us. And so, is immigration good for America? I think immigration is good for every country in the world. It's not, I think that when, uh, you know, we bring a lot more, we, we bring our accents, so I say, yeah, it's good. Uh, you know, Robbie can teach you all about bachata here. Uh, but it's also, you know, I think it's the drive that immigrants bring to, to any country. I think when Americans go overseas, it's the same thing. Uh, and it's, I think that we, as human beings, do our best when we are in survival mode. And that's what immigration does. You are removed from all of those things that give you the comfort that you normally have, family, networks, even money, and, and all of those resources. And with that, it's just you and you alone. And so that kind of puts all of the senses in alert. And that's how he found his company. That's how I found mine. I was driving, 
and it just came, and I was like really desperate to build something like that, and I said, I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna do it myself, and people told me, no, I just went and did it. And when people told me nobody's gonna have a smartphone, poor people will never buy smartphones, I say yes, they will, and they are right now. Fastest growing group. So I think, I think it's all of that, and we have a lot of immigrants that are founders. Uh, there's one right here in the group, uh, uh, Ken Law, the co-founder of, of Visio TV, is one of the, the most innovative companies, so I think he, immigration is great. Him and a you came here with a PhD? No. Or do you get it here? I came here uh, right out of undergrad, and then I did the master's and PhD program in the US. And you helped lead the DC city government? Yes, I was a uh, school principal, assistant superintendent of schools, director of parks and recreation, and chief of staff of the city. And you now help co found a company that has how many employees? We went from two in three, year, three and a half years ago to 65 now. So you have 65 employees? Yes. Uh, so did you create jobs? I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no one else heard anything I said. Uh, Todd, it was, it was really good. tell us about who you are and what you do. I'm Todd Schulte. I'm the president of Forward US. We're a bipartisan advocacy campaign. Uh, trying to fix our broken immigration laws. Um, we were started by the leaders in the business and technology community four years ago, we're currently operating in 29 states around the country. And our job is how do we create the kind of bipartisan consensus and pushing on both sides so that Congress can actually finally fix our immigration laws. And a lot of that is making the case for why immigration I is a positive thing. And I will tell you, the question of is immigration a, a, a positive economic one um, isn't actually a, a question. And I think it's always interesting that, um, and I know this is why you asked the question, um, the economic data around immigrants not only is overwhelmingly positive for America as a country, but for native-born Americans as well, which is ultimately, I think, the more interesting political question and the place that we need to, to fight here. And, um, I will say as a Washington, D.C. resident that the best thing about D.C. that no one appreciates is the park, so thank you. It's on me. It's on me. <laughs> Lynn. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Lynn Shotwell. I'm uh, with the Council for Global Immigration, which is an affiliate at the Society for Human Resource Management, which is the world's largest HR association. We have 280,000 members in 165 countries. So what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I work with the human resources and legal professionals who are responsible for maintaining immigration compliance as they move their teams around the world. And then what we also do is we work with governments. Uh, we've, we've worked here in the U.S. for 45 years, um, but we work internationally with governments to try to help them develop sensible migration policies. Because I think, you know, as, as I go around the world and I talk to these leaders, business leaders get it. Um, I think most policymakers understand that immigration is a net positive. It's what's made the United States great. Others want to be like us. Um, but they're all dealing with this tension between how do you have an open migration system that facilitates um, the economic growth that we need, but then at the same time, how do you continue to create uh, jobs for, for natives who are feeling very threatened with these changes that are happening in our economy that we've been talking about today? I think there's a solution. Um, but it's a balancing act everywhere. Do you think it should be a policy of the United States to attract the best and the brightest people from around the world? Anybody want to jump in? Uh, I'll start. Absolutely, and I think the people who are best determined uh, or in the best place to decide who the best and the brightest are are um, business, right? I mean, I think one of the things we've seen around the globe is that when you have systems that allow employers to sponsor people that they've found, either because they've gone to local universities, they've gone out and recruited internationally. You don't have the problem of you know, doctors driving taxi cabs because they come in with a job offer. And so I am very much in favor of that. Um, but you know, I, I have some concerns when we start talking about creating complex government systems where the government's somehow selecting who the best and the brightest are. But isn't that? an argument that resonates well in the coastal democratic states. Let's say I'm a senator from Alabama, which will never happen. Um, <laughs> I don't see any need for immigrants, I would argue, and has been argued to me. Why can't you just hire Americans for these positions? So if you were a senator from Alabama who 
I won't talk about former senators from Alabama. We'll just talk about current senators from Alabama. What I would say to you is this, that if you look at the growth areas in Alabama, where you're in the Wiregrass region there, that native-born employment has been directly correlated to the ability to attract an agricultural guest worker program. That if you go through Alabama, you get those like big peanuts there, that we don't have enough Americans who are going to go out there, and that's hurting Americans, not just the Americans who are employing those people, but the people around there. And if you go up north to Birmingham into the aerospace sector, we were able to create more American jobs if we're able to bring in more of the best of the brightest into Birmingham to drive forth the space program around there in places like that. And there's a direct correlation. And ultimately, if our goal is this, we have problems with our immigration system. The goal isn't just more of something. The goal is how do we design an immigration system that builds a strong middle class in the 21st century? We have problems with our immigration we need to fix. We can better protect those workers. We can better bring up their wages here. And that's true as Alabama is where it's true. And I'm from in Missouri. If you look at the fastest growing company in Missouri, not a place that's coastal, not a place that people think of as being driven by immigrants, Express Scripts. It's a company that's been driven and founded by an immigrant there. That's not certainly, I mean, unless you count the coast of the Mississippi, it's a tremendous example of the ability to have a culture that attracts the best and the brightest to be able to come here and be entrepreneurial. But, go ahead. Um, I mean, what I found in interviewing companies is that the companies that are able to grow is, in the US is when they're able to find people. But when companies go out and recruit on college campuses, they find at the master's degree and above level, uh, almost 80%, almost 80% of the master's degree and above in electrical engineering are international students on US college campuses, and over 70% in computer science. So when companies go to recruit, that's a major part of, of the labor pool. If you were to, when you close that off, as we often do every year because we don't have enough H-1B visas, companies don't just give up. They end up hiring, especially if they have the size, they hire outside the country and more jobs and growth go outside the country. Uh, and it's very difficult for companies to grow if they're not able to find the people. And Jimena could talk about how, how challenging it is uh, to find people who have tech talent. Yeah, it is incredibly difficult. I, I, I don't get offended when people say hire American, buy American. I think it sounds fine to me. Chile say the same, uh, you know, hire Chileans and Mexico saying the same thing. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I do think that that rhetoric sometimes uh, ignores the difficulties of uh, filling some of these positions that, for example, in my experience, have been unfilled for a long time. And for startup, Every position that is uh, not filled, it means that there's no growth, or at least in that area, that the growth is the growth is not as supposed to as supposed to be. And so there is tremendous. It's a big threat on having these vacancies there. And when we put positions out there, we have positions for six months, seven months, and the quality of the applicants is extremely uh, low. The number is low, and also the the, the, match, the match with the skill with the skill set. In the, in the job position, uh, and we run into applicants that are extremely talented, and they happen to be in some kind of uh, need for a visa or OPT uh, or, or related. You know, we we will be irresponsible f uh, with our investors and with our clients if we don't hire that person or if we don't try everything that we can. But hiring uh, foreign uh, employees is much much harder. It's expensive. It requires a tremendous amount of effort on the, on the uh, founders and you know, the, the, the company's management team. Uh, and it's not, it's not at all super available. I mean, we all know about the lottery and all of that stuff, but, but besides all of that, it's just incredibly uh, time consuming. Um, so, I mean, I can go on and on and on about the challenges of that, but I think that if we will have the talent there, we would not hire foreign employees. I mean, but, but Americans are unemployed. I, I was on an immigration panel a few years ago with a member of Congress, and what he said was, it's better to hire a, a grade, an American with a B average than a foreigner with an A average. And that's what should you think that should be our national policy? I think if th this country wouldn't be what it is if we will have that kind of policy. It's just completely un-American to think that you're going to hire something less than excellent because that's what's av available. And, and I, look, I would, I don't know who that congressman is. I, the, um, the idea that there's a fixed number of jobs, this gets talked about as if it's like a debatable point. It's not. Like, the, the, we don't live in a zero-sum economy. Um, 
There are industries and there are specific cases where that's the way the world works. Um, I just think it's not a debatable point and I think people who have advocated for immigration being increased for a long time have made a mistake by even assuming that one, that that's a debatable economic point. It's not. It is a real political powerful weapon though. And I think when I hear a congressman talk about that, as someone who spent the first two thirds of my career working on getting people elected, that's how people talk when they're trying to get reelected. Um, and I think it's our job as people on the stage is how do we actually explain to people that's not how the economy works. That's not what's gonna help native born Americans. It's just saying, we won't let a foreigner come in and even compete for your job. We won't let our companies compete in a global environment. Well, but look what happened when there was Republicans and Democrats that got together a few years ago to try to come up with an immigration bill. I mean, it was, um, for some of them, it was almost political suicide because there, there are people in the political world who will run against those people and say, he voted or she voted to allow illegal, or to allow other people coming from other countries to take our American jobs. How do you answer that? I don't think that's true. I don't, I think you can name, I mean, I, I really mean that. I think like the politics on this are much different than they're perceived to be. I think that in a Republican presidential primary in a 17 way field, you can grab 30% of the vote by saying things about people. I think that's absolutely true. I think if I ask everybody in this room here, I think you can find one example in the last 25 years of a member of Congress who you said immigration in a primary from the right is the number one reason that they lost. It can be a contributing factor in one or two cases, but I just, I mean, I just don't think, I mean, Chris Cannon in Utah is who it is. I just don't think that that's borne out here. I think people are scared of a primary, and I think that's different. And I think they talk themselves into thinking it's easier and putting their head down. But I think if you'd put a vote up for the floor, I think of the House of Representatives, the Senate bill, I think it would have passed. And I think you wouldn't have seen people lose primaries because of it. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Well, one of the um, things that President Trump raised in his only address to Congress was merit-based immigration. Mm -hmm. And he specifically gave the examples, I think, of Australia and Canada. Or was that me that gave them? Um, and he talked about, let's figure out who we want here and then go after them. Any thoughts on that? I have sure. lots of thoughts. <laughs> uh, please, well, you, you start, start and then we'll yeah. go to you. Here. I mean, I, I think really that I think most people who, who examine what, what uh, Donald Trump has talked about, it really looks like just a way to eliminate family immigration categories as opposed to raise the number of people who would come in that have skills. Um, and I think if you look at these other countries, uh, they actually, Australia and Canada have about, <clears throat> admit about two to three times as many immigrants as a percentage of the population. That is not gonna be a feature of any of, any of these types of reforms. And I would also say for tech companies, as we saw back in 96, when there was an attempt to pit family immigration against, against uh, the high tech companies, um, it's really very politically dicey for high-tech companies because any reform that's made in this area is almost definitely going to be to eliminate about three to four million people who are already waiting for family immigration uh, visas. And I think that companies, uh, we've seen what happened with Uber with the travel ban. I think nowadays, uh, I think anything we saw back in 96 with it being controversial, I think you'd have to multiply that by 10 with social media. But it might give him and us some clients. <laughs> so, so let me just start out. When, when we talk about Canada and Australia, the most important thing to understand is that they, they have both a points-based system where individuals who don't have job offers can self-nominate um, and say, you know, here are my skills, here's my background, and they gain points and they can kind of self-immigrate. But that runs alongside an employer-sponsored system where employers have all the access to all the visas they need. So we don't even have the first part of that. We, the, the, one of the challenges with the US system is we in many ways have a merit-sponsored system. We give the first cut at visas to people who are extraordinary ability, the next set to kind of master's degrees, fewer for people with bachelor's degrees, and then we have almost zero visas available for the low-skilled jobs that are so essential to this country. So we have this. The challenge we have is we have to figure out how do you, you know, how do you allow more visas? I mean, that's the, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. I don't think it's a matter of selecting. We have lots of, the 
thing, the advantage we have over so many other countries is that people want to come to the United States. They want to live here. It's an open country. We have a history of integrating well. When I talk to some other countries, you know, I'll name Sweden. The Swedes are saying, how do we attract people here? It's really cold. Nobody wants to learn Swedish. Um, you know, how do they come here? And even in Australia, people, you, you see that people are immigrating to Australia to get Australian citizenship so that then they have an easier shot at coming to the United States on an E3 visa because H-1Bs aren't available. I mean, this is, we still have a, this, we're a, a land that attracts people and we have this golden opportunity, but I'm afraid we're gonna squander it. Um, so I think, you know, I think we have to be really clear about what we're trying to do, and I agree with Stuart that um, this, that some of the focus on merit is a way to detract from some of the issues we have on family immigration. And we have to find a way to, to solve both of those because we want families here too. We do. Uh, uh, we is a big word. Um, and I'm just saying you both sound very politically correct to me uh, rather than trying to make some of the hard decisions and trade-offs that, that the president and the Congress will have to make. Robbie, how do you feel listening to this? Because I don't think you would have gotten here on a merit-based um, would you have, or, did, or how did you get here, and what are you willing to share, and what are you thinking when you listen to this? Because I guess under Gary's merit based or Trump's based merit based, you wouldn't have gotten here, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I came in 2007, and I actually I got denied back home uh, a normal uh, student visa. I I, I, my only choice was, uh, or you come as a tourist. And sadly, a lot of, and that's, that's what kind of sucks about the immigration, that a lot of people that go with a tourist visa ends up staying in, you know. In my case, I, I was raised with uh, good parenting, and they always told me, you always do the, 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 the right thing with dignity. So I went back home, applied for the student, got denied, uh, because they feel that you're gonna stay. So I ended up reapplying, got my student visa, and I came with the, the dream of being a musician, because I used to be in the whole music back home. And so this whole thing is pretty new to me, but that's how I kind of came into this country as a student visa, and then I figured it out working under the table, and through the long, hard journey, I met my wife, and I actually just became a US citizen uh, five months ago, so. Congratulations, yeah. we're glad to have you. But I, I guess uh, everyone has uh, like a different journey, you know, and. It's, a, it's very difficult. What are you thinking hearing this? Because I, I, I want to, in a sense, not only separate you because you're two immigrants, but, but you have two business stories, yeah. and we have three like big so, thinking policy two, people. And me, yeah. yeah. Pardon me? No, just two big thinkers. I'm just. Oh, <laughs> well, you're. <laughs> okay. I am totally for the merit based uh, system. I, I don't think that is an issue with that. Uh, I don't think it can be. As something that will jeopardize families to stay. If we, if we do things right, that wouldn't be the case. But I don't think we should stay away from talking about marriage because right now what we're doing is uh, really lowering the, the probably the, making, making the, the, the outcome a lot more based in luck and chance than actually based on the probability that the people will be successful after they get the H-1B. So this year it was 200,000 people who applied. Last year it was 250, I believe, to 40 something. Uh, and uh, there are only 85,000 visas available and they all go with very little assessment to this poll that it goes through a lottery. So it's just like putting a piece of paper inside of a bag and there you can have people that are really driven, that are gonna contribute right away, that are gonna create, uh, maybe work in a company for two years, they become an entrepreneur uh, and create more jobs, or, or people that are, that are just, just being here for 12 years, studying under scholarships, and we send them right back because they didn't make, make it through the lottery. So I do feel that having some kind of point system or merit-based system before the lottery is very important for both, for the candidate and for the company. So companies like mine, we have three, three employees right now on H-1Bs. Uh, but it's incredibly difficult to do. We don't have a legal uh, team in-house. So I complete the visas. We have lawyers that are excellent. But I still have to do a lot of the paperwork. We don't have a full-blown human resources team. So all of, those, all, of the, all of the time that we spend, other 
entities that are bringing in thousands of visas, uh, they can do it like a machine. And so we, we see, and for what I've seen, some of those visas are not necessarily uh, going to the places where it could be a lot of return of investment. And so I think that if there were, it was any kind of reform, they can take a look at the merit of the company as well. Is this company a promising company that by having these individuals is potentially, potentially gonna grow really fast? Or is this a company that is uh, using the lowest entry job position uh, and getting them you know, by the dozen or the hundreds? So I think that could be, and then on the candidate side, one of our employees, she had a liberal studies degree. And she went through the lottery, she got the, the, the lottery, and then we had to, she got rejected after that because of her degree. So I had to do all this kind of, uh, you know, write these letters, do all this research, and, and figure out a way to tell uh, immigration services that for my industry, she was the right worker. And so, and, my, and you were ready to open a Canadian office if she didn't get. When she got rejected, we were, you know, it was actually yeah. as much easier than, than going through the process. So. Uh, I feel that there is a lot of opportunity in enhancing the process before the already happens, adding some type of medivac system. So if we assume that the, one of the great purposes of immigration law is to enhance the national economic well-being, and there is, number one, tremendous value in diversity that we never really talk about because that allows more creativity and innovation. We have different people, especially compared to a lot of the countries I visit in Asia, where it's homogeneous and there's not the type of creativity we see here. And if you assume that's a good thing, and if you assume that cre job creation and company creation is a good thing, and you said it so beautifully about the, the fact, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the words you just used up on stage about the, you, when you're desperate, you work harder, and, and, and America is a land of immigrants. If you assume all of that is good, but, and if you also assume, and, and disagree with me if you want, that we need some type of limit. We just can't have open immigration for everyone. We can't take in 10 million, 50 million people a year. Then we're, and, and you also assume we should have immigration. So we're between zero and 50 million a year. What are the standards we should use in a clean society? I mean, one of the, I'll share one bias I have. My wife is a doctor outside of Detroit. And she talks about how the immigrant families come in, not, they bring their parents in and their relatives, and they don't speak English. They go immediately on social services, and they are living off the United States Treasury, essentially, as being brought in as family members. And so what are the reasonable guardrails, as we talk about, in immigration that also allow the speed ramps for those that are really going to enhance the value of the United States? In the ideal world for each of you, what would they be? I mean, right now, there are limits on welfare, uh, and, and if you need to tighten those welfare uh, limits, that, that would be fine. But, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with Americans being able to sponsor their child, uh, you know, that's 19 years old, saying that that's okay, but if the child is 22, if they have another child that's 22 years old, they can't sponsor them anymore. I'm not sure how that, you know, enhances the national interest. I think you could keep the same family categories we have now. I think you could add more employment-based green cards. Uh, I think you need to eliminate the per country limit because people from India now could wait, uh, I estimate potentially, you know, three to seven decades potentially, uh, if you're in the third preference. Uh, but that needs to be solved by, you know, eliminating the per country limit and, and increasing the numbers. But I don't think you need to have radical changes to have something that enhances the system more. I think you need to increase the number of H-1B visas also as well. Um, I think not being able to do that will actually have a very negative impact on uh, being able to attract international students here in the first place. So you say add more visas. Robbie, how do we get people like you in without keeping people like you out? Wow, that's a difficult one. <laughs> That's a very difficult one because uh, I'm a believer of passion. You know, whether you're from whatever country you're from, you could be American, you could be from wherever, but if you don't have the passion, um, you're not going to go anywhere. And, uh, you know, I feel bad about when people uh, come to this country and then they want to bring the whole shebang and then they live off the country resources um, because I, I was one of those that came without nothing but I'm not bringing my whole family from the Dominican Republic to live off my resources because, you know, I just, you know, those are the things that it's very hard to, to speak about. But 
I'm a believer of passion. That's good. Yeah. Amanda, what would you change? Uh, in the H-1B process, I will change the, um, I will put some kind of more rigor in the assessment of companies and candidates before the lottery. Right now it's too, um, it's too weak. Uh, I will add uh, the new jobs because right now when you look as an employer on the drop down menu, you find these jobs that don't necessarily fit the new industries. And so you're trying to make them fit and it can, they kind of do, they kind of don't. And so then later on it makes, it, it causes problems after the, after the lottery uh, happens. Uh, so all of these jobs with artificial intelligence, machine learning, all the, you know, the work that we do, civic technology, is not there. And so um, I spent a lot of time doing the appeal, and we were, so, but that could be changed. So you would look at where we need jobs today, all the... The uh, new jobs should be added. The 50,000 or so cyber jobs that are available and, just in this area alone exactly. that we can't get people I to I think the, the classification in the Department of Labor, um, you know, drop down menu should change, should be, should be out, you know, updated. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, any last ones? I want to keep going. Sure. Todd? Yeah, I actually, so I, I just want to pull out one thing we're talking about, which is, and I'm, and I'm really glad you brought this up because this is a really important point news on this concept of merit based and what this means. So, how many people in this room, by a show of hands, support largely keeping the family based system as you know it roughly intact and essentially doubling the number of employment slash skilled based visas in this country? Okay, second show of hands. How many people want to keep the employment and skills-based visas where it is right now and slash the family-based immigration system by 85%? Those are both accurately described often as a merit-based immigration system or have been at different times here. Chuck Schumer has talked about a merit-based immigration system. Nancy Pelosi talked about an immigration system. Jeff Sessions, Stephen Miller, and Steve Bannon have talked about a merit-based immigration system. And I think that's important to like dig in on the policy there. That those that, that that's why this term you're kind of hearing us go back and forth. Um, what I think we should do is there are changes we should make to our family-based immigration system um, that you know modernize the needs we have here and things like that. Um, you know, and I and I think. Um, Changing that around the edges is fine. What I think we should do is actually meet the needs of today's economy by increasing the ability. And to what you said here, we have this incredible competitive advantage of being a nation that draws the best and the most entrepreneurial from around the world. We should have a legal visa system that fits the needs there, and that's going to help native born the most, rather than say we need to slash family-based immigration system to meet some arbitrary cap we have right now. Lynn? So I would agree with everything that's been said. And I think the important thing to recognize is that the limits we have on immigration right now were set out in 1990. So particularly in the employment-based side, the world's a different place. And so I think what we have to do, we have to see immigration as part of this larger ecosystem. We're never, even if we opened our borders, we're not going to meet all of our skills needs with immigration because countries everywhere around the world are facing the same skills gaps. And so we have to see immigration is going to be a piece of filling that gap. But we've got to do the things we were talking about this morning, the veterans, the K through 12 education, all of those things. And I actually, in addition to working on immigration, I lead the workforce readiness initiatives at SHRM because we see that we are going to need talent from wherever we can get it um, in the future. We just simply haven't had enough babies to both replace ourselves and continue to grow the economy. So we have to do that. On, on the um, immigration system, you know, clearly I think if, if you have employers that are making job offers and are willing to jump through all of the hoops and pay all of the fees to sponsor a foreign worker, whether it's a high-skilled tech worker, whether it's an ag worker, that probably means that they've gone out and tested the labor market and they're not finding Americans. Because under the law, they have to pay the same wages and give the same working conditions. So everything else being equal, there's a reason they're willing to invest in this immigration system and pay these additional fees. It costs anywhere from $5,000 to get an H-1B visa up to about $30,000 if you go all the way through the green card system with an employee. So that tells me that you know, employers are not doing this for cheap labor. They're doing this because they, they feel that this talent's critical to, to their operations. On family immigration, certainly think, and when we've been big supporters, that you need to kind of keep the family unit together, um, spouses of whatever sex, um, children, 
Uh, parents, I think you, we have to recognize kind of the families that exist. I think one of the challenges is brothers and sisters. We're about the only country in the world that continues to provide for immigration of brothers and sisters. I would grandfather in everybody who's waiting, um, but I think it might be an area where we need to think about down the, few, down the road. Well, that you will have the last word, Lynn. I want to thank the panelists. I think we can agree that, number one, immigration is good for future of jobs. Immigration is important to the future of the United States, and we need immigration in many different ways under almost any different definition to succeed as a country. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives.